Hello everyone, welcome to Making a Home in Silvertown, a guided walk in association with Newham Heritage Festival and the Access and Engagement team at Birkbeck, University of London. My name is Matt and I'm your tour guide for this sequence of three videos leading you on a historic guided walk around Silvertown, one of East London's most interesting neighbourhoods. Silvertown is part of London's Docklands and is in the London borough of Newham. The area's history has been shaped by the River Thames, the docks and the unrivalled variety of shipping, cargoes and travellers passing through the Port of London. The walk focuses on the many people from around the country and around the world who've made their homes here and how residents have coped with the sometimes challenging conditions in the area. It will include plenty of historical images from Newham's archives. There's always more to explore about this unique part of London and I hope the videos inspire you to research further. The reason why this walk is online, instead of me leading you around Silvertown in person, is that as we record this, the UK has restrictions on movement and public assembly due to the uh, pandemic of COVID-19 or coronavirus. So the idea is you can download these videos onto a device and follow their route around the area, pausing them where necessary. The videos are meant to be modular, each one begins and ends at a local Docklands Light railway station. Uh, you can do them one after the other and have a long walk that might take an hour and a half to two hours, or break it into three shorter walks if you prefer. This first stretch might take around 45 minutes, with the other two lasting maybe 30 minutes each, depending on what pace you set. This first video shows you sites near West Silvertown DLR, which is the western end of the red line on this image. We'll then follow the red route to Pontoon Dock Station. The second leg in the next video is a circular route beginning and ending at Pontoon Dock, while the third video takes you from Pontoon Dock to London City Airport. There are step-free routes throughout the walk, and the first two sections are quite flat, uh, with gentle slopes on the third section. Some roads in the area can get busy, so please take care when crossing. Uh, the coronavirus pandemic is a fluid situation, it might well have changed by the time you hear this, but the current advice is to socially distance, maintaining two metres from anyone not in your household. You should also avoid public transport unless essential. If you're not sure whether this guidance has changed, the Mayor of London and the London Assembly, as well as Transport for London, have information on whether and how you can travel safely. If you're based within walking or cycling distance of Silvertown, that might not be a problem, but if you can't get to the area safely yet, please just enjoy the videos for now and plan a walk for when things are closer to normal. Silvertown is actually quite new compared to many London districts. Until the mid-19th century, it was beyond London's outskirts in Plasto Marshes, a virtually uninhabited wetland. This 1786 engraving by John Peltro shows perhaps a similar scene, but is further upstream near the mouth of Bow Creek and what's now Canning Town. To get an idea of the Silvertown area at this period, imagine this picture but with even less sign of people around. So how did Silvertown come into being? During the 19th century, London expanded at a mind-boggling rate. Its population roughly quadrupled between 1800 and 1900. That's largely due to its role as the capital of the expanding British Empire and the job opportunities resulting from all the goods entering the Port of London from imperial territories, not to mention people being driven into London to escape extreme hardship elsewhere. I'm thinking here of the Great Famine in Ireland during the 1840s, for example. So the amount of shipping and port facilities needed to keep this metropolis working was increasing drastically. Additionally, by the middle of the century, steamships were more common. Steam power enabled ships to become much larger, so London needed new, bigger docks to unload and uh, load these vessels. Hence the building of the Royal Docks Complex on Plasto Marshes. The first of these docks was the Victoria Dock, opening in 1855. That's the basin which is nearest in this picture. The perspective in the photograph is facing due east. That basin was followed by the Royal Albert Dock in 1880. That's further away and to the left than the King George V Dock in 1921, seen here to the right of the Albert. Silvertown is the area to the bottom right of this photograph, sandwiched between the Royal Docks and the River Thames. Now, Silvertown is named after Stephen William Silver, a merchant who established some of the first industrial premises here in 1852. Uh, this was a rubber works which originally made waterproof clothing. Remember, this is still three years before the Victoria Dock opened. 
The dock's construction was more or less complete and there had been draining of the marshes, but not much business was taking place yet, so Silver's move from Greenwich was both bold and pioneering. Also a great success, the company later expanded to become the India Rubber, Gutter Perch and Telegraph Works Company, one of whose delivery vehicles is seen here. The company was noted for submarine telegraph cables, cutting-edge technology that revolutionised global communications. It also manufactured some of Alexander Graham Bell's first telephones. This may give you some idea of the role Silver Towers played in changing not just the Docklands, but perhaps the world. So we're beginning our walk by West Silvertown DLR, uh, next to North Woolwich Road, the major thoroughfare that runs alongside the light railway. Looking to the east, you'll see a Pelican Crossing. Don't cross at this point, even though the other side of the street uh, used to have something that I would definitely cross the road for, the Jubilee Tavern. It's uh, been here well, since around uh, 1895, but in this photograph it's uh, yeah, the beginning of the 1960s. Most of the jobs in this area involved gruelling manual labour in the docks or in factories. Uh, this was all very thirsty work and uh, Silvertown supported a lot more pubs than it does currently. This is despite efforts by the temperance movement who were campaigning against alcohol in East London during the late 19th century. It's one of these fierce teetotalers whose commercial contributions to the area we're going to look at next. From the DLR station, head east past the Pelican Crossing, then take a right turn onto Knights Road. Head down the street until you see a large industrial site on your right. Uh, you're looking at Plasto Wharf Sugar Refinery. The image here is of the site's old entrance, which has since been demolished, along with many of the other buildings here. Uh, the refinery used to be even bigger than this. It was opened in 1883 by Abram Lyle, a shipping merchant originally from Greenock in Scotland. So he's an example of someone who moved a long way to set up business in this area. He was also, as I mentioned, passionately opposed to the drinking of alcohol. He encouraged other, some other indulgences, though. His company perfected the processing of byproducts from sugar refining to create Lyle's Golden Syrup, which many of you may still enjoy today. More than a million cans of syrup still leave this plant every month. Abram Lyle was a bitter rival of Henry Tate, whose sugar refinery was also in Silvertown. We'll see it in the third video of this series. The two never actually met and went to great lengths to avoid doing so. As they, after they passed away, their families merged the companies in 1921, forming Tate and Lyle. Lyle still dominated the sugar market, syrup market at that point, while Tate was supreme in sugar, so this was a good match. Uh, both refineries saw major social changes for people in the area. So during the Second World War, for example, work here, previously male-dominated, was increasingly performed by women after men were called up to fight. Tate and Lyle itself doesn't own either of the refineries in Silvertown anymore. They were sold to American Sugar Refining in 2010, along with the rights to use Tate and Lyle's branding for sugar and syrup. Continue along Knights Road, follow it round to your left, then head northeast up Bradfield Road. Eventually you'll see tennis courts and a park entrance on your right. This is Lyle Park, created on land donated to the local council for this purpose by Leonard Lyle, a descendant of Abram Lyle, in 1924. Housing in Silvertown was badly crowded in the 1920s. With factories taking up so much room and the docks and the river blocking expansion, workers who wanted to live in the area had to cram into tight spaces. Open space to relax and exercise was therefore incredibly precious. Take a moment to explore the park if you like. At the far end, there's a nice view across the Thames, and the park contains the entrance gates to Hull and Wolf Limited, a shipping shipbuilding firm. Uh, from the park, continue north onto North Woolwich Road. Carefully cross the road, uh, then go, go up Boxley Street, which is next to the nearby petrol station. At the far end, turn left, then take an immediate right onto Julia Garfield Mews. At the end of the Mews, continue straight ahead, along a footpath that leads underneath a building. At the other side, you're on Wesley Avenue, and you're now in the heart of Britannia Village. This is an example of what city planners sometimes call an urban village, with retail, housing and leisure all available within one self-contained area. There are also facilities to draw the local community together, like a village hall and a Britannia Village Primary School. This neighbourhood was redeveloped between 1994 and 2000, having previously been a mixture of dockside facilities, mills and housing, notably a pair of tower blocks that the council felt were no longer fit for purpose. The village's buildings incorporate lots of structures which are meant to resemble features of ships, such as portholes and masts, to nod to Silvertown's maritime history. 
The village represents regeneration on an ambitious scale, but it's only the first stage of an even grander plan to regenerate the south side of the Royal Victoria Dock. And I'll show you the next phase soon. So go across Wesley Avenue and continue walking north, taking a passageway that leads through the large semicircular building you see ahead of you. You'll emerge into a plaza facing towards a raised footbridge across the Royal Victoria Dock. If you wish, you can ascend to the bridge for an even more beautiful view of the dock. There's a lift as well as stairs. Nowadays, this dock basin often feels rather tranquil. There's still a lot of business around the dock, but this tends to be based around sales and hospitality, often transacted at the Excel Centre, the huge commercial events venue that you'll see at the northern end of the bridge. At the time of recording, the Excel Centre is home to a, a Nightingale Hospital set up to care for patients with coronavirus. As a working dock, though, the atmosphere here was very different. During the late 19th and early 20th centuries especially, the air would be full of noise like the yells of workers and the operation of machinery, as well as smoke from steamships and all the factories nearby. One obvious legacy of this history is the dockside cranes. The two furthest cranes in this picture may date from the 1920s. The others are comparatively modern and installed in 1962. These were electric and used to run on rails up and down the dockside. The Victoria Dock is around 13 metres deep and it's incredible to think that uh, although steam engines were used to carry away some of the spoil as the basin was dug, much of the work was still carried out simply with shovels and wheelbarrows. Excavated soil was taken upstream to Battersea where it consolidated the marshy ground that would become Battersea Park. So if you're walking in that park you're actually treading on earth from plaster marshes. The Royal Dock specialised in handling foodstuffs. After opening in 1855, the Victoria Dock had an immediate impact on the diversity of this area's population. In particular, many so-called Lascars began to settle nearby. Lascars were sailors from South Asia coming to London aboard British ships. Job opportunities for work handling cargoes in the docks themselves attracted other new arrivals, with the Irish being well represented, but these jobs could be precarious, exhausting and badly paid. Some jobs did have better security and status, like the corn porters who unloaded grain from ships into the dockside silos or mills, or the stevedores who had the complex task of stacking cargoes on board the ships, and these were seen as skilled occupations. Most of the dockers, though, who moved cargoes on quaysides and within warehouses were casual labour throughout nearly all of the dock's history. Uh, these dockers are at the Royal Albert Dock, but the scene at Royal Victoria would be similar. Dockers were casual labour because the number of ships using the port could vary enormously and employees didn't want to pay lots of men who might sometimes stand idle. If you wanted to work in the docks on a given day, you'd show up at the dock entrance for an event called the Corlon, where gangers or supervisors would pick the men they wanted on their gang that day. There were usually fewer jobs available than there were dockers. Men might go for two months or more without getting a shift, and brutal fights broke out over the tickets that gangers would give to their chosen dockers as permits to uh, work. Until the great dock strike of 1889, when dockers won more rights, even if you were chosen, you might be sent home after just an hour's work, with only an hour's pay. This meant that, especially prior to the growth of the welfare state in the 1940s, dockers were at constant risk of homelessness and starvation, hence their sheer desperation for work. The dockers didn't achieve decasualisation and gain proper job security until 1967, by which time London's docks were losing trade rapidly and beginning to close. The Royal Docks Complex was the last set of docks in London to shut to commercial traffic in 1981. And this was a huge blow to Silvertown's economy, creating a need for regeneration that's still being addressed today. Now head east along the dockside until you come to a fence that blocks your path. The enormous building in front of you is Spiller's Millennium Mills, a major part of Silvertown's heritage and a subject of ongoing regeneration efforts. At the pier that extends in over the dock waters, there are two ships. The nearer one is London Light Vessel 93, a light ship built at Dartmouth in 1938. It's never had an engine and used to be towed into place to operate as a sort of mobile lighthouse. The other vessel, SS Robin, is the only complete Victorian steamship in existence with its original steam engine and boiler. Launched in London in 1890, it was a coaster, a small cargo ship operating in coastal waters. There's an ongoing project to turn the ship into a heritage attraction open to the public. The pier itself was previously, well, previously supported these marvellous structures, elevators that would take on grain from the holds of ships. The grain could then either be transferred directly into the dockside mills or decanted into barges to be transported elsewhere. 
The original Millennium Mills building was constructed for William Vernon and Sons in 1905. This company was based in Birkenhead in the northwest. The mills are named after Millennium Flour, the company's premium product, which was massively popular in northern mining towns. Millennium Mills created capacity to supply this flour to the south as well. Flour mills like this were major employers of women even outside of wartime, and it was common in local families for menfolk to work in the docks while women worked in the mills. Management, however, remained uh, entirely male. The original Millennium Mills was destroyed in 1917 in the disaster known as the Silvertown Explosion, which we'll learn about in the second section of this walk. The site was then bought by the company Spillers in 1920, and the mills were rebuilt in Art Deco style in 1933. Unfortunately, that impressive site didn't last very long. During the Second World War, London's Docklands was perhaps the most heavily bombed part of the entire country. The docks' role in, impor in importing food and raw materials was vital for Britain's war effort, as were the factories and naval facilities in the area. This led to the Docklands being a major target for German air raids during the Blitz. Silvertown suffered terribly from bombing, and inevitably it wasn't just business premises that were hit, but housing too. Electoral rolls show the population of Silvertown plummeting during the war, and that's partly a result of evacuations, but also because so much housing was just flattened, which of course sadly involved many deaths. Millennium Mills, also severely damaged, was rebuilt as the present structure, reopening in 1953. Uh, the site has been essentially derelict since the dock closed in 1981. There were long-term plans to regenerate the area, going back to the 1990s, when other mills along this stretch of dockside were demolished. Millennium Mills, though, is locally listed by Newham Council and must be incorporated into any redevelopment plans. Uh, to see the site from a different angle, head south onto Rayleigh Road, away from the dockside, until you reach a roundabout with a tall chimney in the middle. To the right, you will see an entrance to this 62-acre site that's due to become the Silvertown Keys project, following on from uh, Britannia Village's earlier regeneration. When Newham Council gave permission for this redevelopment, the amount of investment involved was estimated at £3.5 billion. Like Britannia Village, the project will combine residential, business and uh, leisure premises, the developers report that 3,000 new homes will be created. Millennium Mills itself will house small businesses. Much work has already taken place inside in preparation, uh, such as removing stray machinery and contaminants like asbestos. Detailed proposals for the de de development are currently being drawn up, and there are online opportunities to have a say in the process. The chimney on the roundabout was originally part of uh, Rank's Empire Mill. Here's an image of it from 1984, which again conveys how regeneration has already changed the area. Apparently, when the rest of the mill was demolished in the 1990s, the chimney was spared at the suggestion of Prince Charles. We're now coming to the end of this section of the walk. Continue south down Rayleigh Road and then Mill Street. The houses on Mill Street are of the type that used to predominate low-rise housing in this area before redevelopment projects like Britannia Village. When you get back to North Woolwich Road, carefully cross over and then turn right, heading east. You'll go past the end of Royal Crest Avenue. If you'd like to continue directly to the second stage of the walk, this is a good point to transition. If you'd rather resume later and need public transport, uh, continue straight ahead and you'll reach Pontoon Dock DLR Station. Thank you for joining me on this section of our guided walk, Making a Home in Silvertown. Thanks also to Newham Heritage Month and the Access and Engagement team at Birkbeck, University of London, for supporting the project. Please do join me again for the second part of the walk, when we'll learn about the Silvertown explosion, uh, how London is protected from floods, and more on the regeneration of this unique area of the city.